Hi, this is Jeffrey Fox, and we're doing cloud computing and big data slash data engineering, the introduction to the course, and we're at the part P of our segmented version of this introduction. And uh, part P is discussing uh, a little more detailed thing we've looked at already, connection between HPC and clouds, and we would give a little more detail on that. All right. So what are we doing? There is a very old concept, the Branscombe Pyramid, which is sort of illuminating. And we will do a little more on things we've discussed already, supercomputers versus clouds, and then some discussion of general issues of what is a scientific computing environment? Is it different from a, it is actually sort of different from a business environment, even if only from the funding. Science, uh, if you look at what's happened since 2000, the web 2.0 slash social media slash nexus of forces revolution has driven an enormous business investment in the technology and the applications of large scale computers and big data. Science funding in this area has remained constant. This has actually decreased. So it's not so easy for science to innovate. Let's see, uh, anyway, let's uh, continue. All right, so Gartner likes high performance computing. And um, it stresses here um, their use in manufacturing, simulating things, oil and gas, life sciences, bioinformatics, and loses a lot of HPC, financial services, calculating the Black Scholes model to endless detail is very time consuming, and also. Milliseconds matter on the stock market. If you have a little advantage and you can apply it at large scale, you need to be the first. And of course, governments use a lot of HPC for national security. Um, simulating the nuclear stockpile and things like that, or using HPC to do what I used to do, the Strategic Defense Initiative, which is uh, tracking missiles from unfriendly people. And as I said, they're often revenue critical, uh, searching for oil and gas, mission critical. I would say SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, is pretty mission critical. And as they say, sometimes both. And they are very focused. They want, uh, they have somewhat smaller systems physically. They're, that's partly just because they, they need to be geographically co located, because they. HPC applications tend to have tight synchronization constraints. They can't afford uh, traveling across a uh, non-trivial distance to link computers together. Whereas in a cloud, that's okay, you can do that. But Amazon can chop up your job and run some on one, in one data center and some on another data center. And then we need accelerators, because the basic chips like uh, Intel Xeons or AMD chips don't run fast enough, so you have GPUs from NVIDIA and AMD, or the nice, nice landing and from uh, Intel, which is actually they've given up because it wasn't a competitive architecture. And of course, NVIDIA is the most famous. It's a thriving HPC company. And then we have networks. Mellanox does InfiniBand, Intel does OmniPath, and both of those outperform easily uh, the leading uh, uh, Ethernet uh, links, which run slower than these dedicated HPC networks. I'm not quite certain why the HPC networks are not more common commercially, because they do outperform gigabit Ethernet, or 40 or 100 gigabit Ethernet. And the other issue is storage. Uh, HPC have high performance storage systems, and most importantly, the link between the storage and the computer is high performance. All right. The only problem is the software was developed for clouds, not for HPC. HPC has lousy software, very specialized lousy software to address the limited, the very focused uh, applications done on that. And so when you try to extend the scope of HPC, you run into the trouble if the software doesn't support it. All right, here's the computing pyramid. And this came from a long time ago. And Branscom, who led a, a, a report, I think, well, for NSF or possibly the National Academy, um, produced this pyramid. 
which basically is trivial. At the, the bottom you have lots of, um, is the size of the number of people involved, and the top is, and as you go up here, we do part. Now, the computer. And uh, here we have desktop computing through national infrastructure. And uh, I would put HPC Cloud here, actually. And the main point of this is sort of trivial, but it emphasizes something which is important to remember that there is no single solution. You're going to want to have, I pointed out, there are going to be so many pleasingly parallel applications. Well, those pleasingly parallel applications, they want a cloud with wonderful internet connectivity. Uh, they do not need um, lots of internal bandwidth because they just want to do a function as a service, invoke the function, process the data from the smartphone, and Store it away somewhere if necessary, and that's it. Then they go to sleep, so they don't charge, use up compute time, and charge compute time. All right, so this is no longer used a lot, but in the past it's been a helpful graph to try to explain why you need, well, it was originally the dying to explain why you need this, and also why you need this. Now, now everything is a cloud, namely these. This stuff here, everything below here or here is probably always satisfiable by clouds. But up here it is so specialized and the architecture is so specialized, um, it's not so obvious. Now this particular version of the Branscombe Pyramid has data written all over it, but that's because it came from a data talk by Roger Barge, not because that Branscombe thought of it that way. What Roger Barge is saying, we may still need the uh, Branscombe Pyramid, even when we're doing data. All right. So here's an important comment. Big data applications are new. And so they can consider emerging technologies. Whereas if you're simulating a battery, that code was written some time ago. And it's very sophisticated. It's relatively hard to port to a, um, port to a cloud. Remember, we want to make it cloud native. Microservices, it's hard to do. Um, I, now, data machine learning is meant to be of growing importance. And that's not so obvious so commercially when, when I look at applications, but I'm pretty certain it's true. It is not well documented. And effectively, this is sort of an interesting uh, issue for the database community. They designed SQL, and SQL was designed for simple queries. Fetch everybody with name Fred. And uh, or, or um, whose who's, uh, bank account is less than zero and do something with them. And or do some average of the number of people and uh, of um, bank account sizes and stuff like that. But now machine learning is very different. It's a much more complex application than that. The traditional SQL is for very simple applications, which didn't use a lot of computing. That's why traditional data repository was just, if you like, an Oracle database. It had very little compute power attached to it because SQL didn't need a compute power. And even SAS, which was doing simple statistics. Simple statistics calculating averages not, not need a big computer. But machine learning is very different. It's an integrative algorithm. The uh, ratio of compute time to a data size is much higher. I've already uh, noted that when you look at um, Data systems, they have large messages because uh, they have large reduction operations, which we call collective in the scientific computing world. So we need new optimization. Um, now, this, it's a, this is really should say HPC clouds here. Yeah? Um, expectation maximization is sort of a class, is the, really a dominant form of machine learning. And iterative map reduce, which was first pointed out by Andrew Ng, uh, it supports that, although we also pointed that out very early on. 2008 was our first paper in that area. Um, as I points out here, the critical issue is these need computing, whereas SQL doesn't need computing. 
And um, we have lots of activities which you'll find on our website on clustering and dimension reduction, which is multi-dimensional scaling, and latent Dirichlet allocation, which is a particularly hard algorithm used, say, by Google, effectively used by Google News or something equivalent to that, to try to take wide range of web documents or other do or web documents and extract information and relate, classify those information into related topics. <coughs> if we look at the, what science uses, it uses some large-scale supercomputers, and we've already described those. <coughs> They're multi-core, high-performance nodes, often with GPU enhancement. Uh, or night's nice landing enhancement, or night's nice corner, or night's nice landing. And they're multi core, they have high performance, low latency network. And they're very suitable for simulations, but they're also pretty suitable for machine learning. Although they may not be optimized for machine learning. Then we have high throughput systems. So high throughput systems are much nearer clouds, except they're even simpler than clouds because they're only doing pleasingly parallel job. And here the LHC data analysis or the um, work done on analyzing signals to look for um, messages from outer space, which is um, boink. Uh, those are of that type. Cycle stealing, namely, if you have pleasingly parallel jobs, you can part, as you don't have, then have any synchronization issues with pleasingly parallel jobs, you can go to your organization at midnight when several of your machines, at least from the more senior people that are empty and not being used, and to use them to do that type of job. So that's cycle stealing, using switch uh, idle uh, personal computers. Now, grids were a huge uh, effort in the scientific computing arena from around 2000 to 2010. And they were effectively collapsed because of clouds. Because clouds were able to do what grids were doing in a much more effective fashion, and clouds were chosen by industry, and grids weren't. And they were basically taking the world's computers and joining them together in a giant federation and building a distributed system. Now, we still have distributed data, but not necessarily the distributed computing. I mean, a cloud, you can think of centralized, at least logically centralized. Um, Computing with receiving data because they have good internet access, receiving data from all over the world. Another critical feature in science, as in business, they all want to use services, software as a service, service oriented architectures, microservices, which they should be using. They also want portals, which are inter GUI interfaces, so the users don't have to keep typing shell commands. They can actually uh, just use a nice uh, user interface. And then workflow, which we've mentioned a few times, that's the orchestration of multiple processes into a single application. <coughs> okay. So, if we compare all these things, we have some sort of, I, I keep mentioning synchronization or communication performance, because it's so critical. Because it, I mean, again, you can think of the real world. When you are really, when you're um, playing a game of soccer, you better have good communication between your 11 players, because uh, that's a really tightly synchronized operation. Everybody has to play as a team in a tightly synchronized fashion. Um, but if you look at um, a lot of other activities in the real world, they're loosely synchronized. And you can even have people working from home and not even being in the same office. And they can be perfectly effective at solving some problems. So synchronization is application dependent. And then if we look at the grids have the worst synchronization, then clouds and classic HPC have the best synchronization, the lowest latency. So this says that clouds can certainly execute anything that runs on a grid, but then cannot necessarily execute what runs on HPC. And then, um, Classic HPC machines can uh, effectively an engine to run this uh, messaging system MPI. And we can sort of illustrate that with the first form. Remember, there are six forms of MapReduce. Uh, we don't want to look at streaming here, because streaming is outside classic HPC considerations. Um, and then we have these four things which you iterated. 
we, we enumerated, sorry, we did not iterate them. <laughs> Iterative map produces the third of them, and classic MPI is what we use for graphs and solving simulations. And then we had map only, totally par parallel. Classic map produce, which is can be implemented with MPI, but it's not necessary because in map produce you are using disk as the I/O as the as the intermediate uh, storage because you don't have synchronization because the different maps in Hadoop can finish at totally different times and you're just fine. You cannot, you're not fine as I've stressed before in numbers three or four because these are iterative, and you if you if one process or task is slower than the others, it will hold up all of them. It's dramatically inefficient. Hello. So let's sort of discuss HPC Cloud and the comparison between ordinary clouds and supercomputers in a little more depth. We've already stressed that exascale simulations are sort of characterized by small space discretization and the small time steps needed to get stable solutions. And they all, these all stem from differential equations. Simulations and science and physics and chemistry are built around differential equations. Because that was what controls the, controls the world. And these numerical formulations need the memory size and the compute power of an exascale machine. So they might need a billion cores just to solve a single problem, your new battery I keep mentioning. Or uh, the CFD simulation of your car colliding with another car. Big data has many differences and some similarities. Um, one of the similarities is that you still have matrices in them. Those matrices are not got the same structure as those in simulations because you don't have the differential operator. And the structure of the sparse matrix in simulations comes from that differential operator. Further. Uh, you don't need these smallnesses, because the data is not of high enough quality. So you probably don't need a giant exascale system to run a single problem. So that's pretty important. It says you don't need a world of giant machines, you just need a world of large machines, or that's hyperscale computing. Um, so you're going to be running job mixes, which include pleasingly parallel. They include MapReduce, that's classic cloud. They also have small to medium sized HPC jobs to do machine learning. And in aggregation, this is certainly more, than, at least an exascale. And in fact, we estimated the clouds are probably an order of magnitude larger than supercomputers uh, in total size. Um, one example is deep learning, which um, doesn't need massive parallelism as far as I know, because stochastic gradient descent doesn't use as many batches. So deep learning needs small accelerator-based HPC clusters as currently implemented. Obviously, there can be changes here because this is a field where the algorithm is still being investigated. But anyway, it doesn't matter so much because even if you want to build a modest site cluster, you need all the software, hardware, and algorithm expertise that you would need to do exascale. Uh, so, but then, and then if we come back to our exascale machine and we happen to have spare time on it, we can certainly use it for HPC clouds as long as we have some I.O. considered correctly. Because uh, you sort of do need to bring the computing to the data, and so there is a strong desire to have disks on the nodes of your machines. Um, if once we've got to this, we can start adding on sort of all nifty issues. We can use DevOps to do software design everything. And uh, we, that will automate the deployment of the clouds and HPC. And then we want to deliver insight and, and wisdom as a service. And we're going to use that with microservices and function as a service, giving you a sophisticated software as a service. So that's what IBM would call their cognitive computing architecture. So that's the last slide of this uh, general discussion of HPC and clouds. Thank you very much.